So Putin's father is away a lot in the Second World War fighting. Trump's father is this kind of distant, rather bullying figure. Xi Jinping's father is actually um, imprisoned because he's caught up in the Cultural Revolution, disappears for about 10 years. So maybe that's something to do with the personality type then later, that then later emerges. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and all the discussion about President Vladimir Putin's strategy, motivation, and even health means that it's tempting to say that Gideon Rockman could not have published his book, The Age of the Strongman, at a better time. Though whether the war advances or helps curtail that age still remains to be seen. But Putin is only one of a number of so-called strongman leaders around the world who are profiled and analyzed by the award-winning journalist who is the chief foreign affairs columnist for the Financial Times. Gideon Rackman, welcome to Times Radio. Thank you very much. So when did the age of the strongman, as you call it, really start? What caused it? Well, I think, um, you know, almost too neatly, it begins right at the beginning of the 21st century. So Putin comes into power on the 31st of December, 1999. Uh, But I think it doesn't become apparent what's going on for quite a while, because for a while, Putin is seen as a kind of either as a Democrat, really, when Bill Clinton first meets him three months after he's coming to power, he says, this is the guy who's going to turn Russia into a proper democracy. And Putin speaks the language of democracy for a while. And then he becomes more overtly violent by about 2008 with the invasion of Georgia and so on. But there, for a while, people think of him as an anomaly. Merkel says he's a 19th century figure in the 21st century. But what's become apparent over the last 20 years is that actually he was a forerunner. And there are a number of these leaders who have a very personalized style of politics, uh, who are authoritarian in instinct. Um, and so you have Erdogan in Turkey in 2003, Xi Jinping in China 2012. Uh, Modi in India 2014, Trump in America 2016, and on and on. And actually, this amounts globally to a kind of erosion of democracy, people who kind of keep score for these things. Yes. Say it's been eroding for about 20 years now. So you've seen a lot of these leaders up close in your day job. I'm I'm interested in the their vibe in the room. I mean, who's the most frightening? Well, I mean, Putin, I think, deliberately, uh, and even some time ago, sets out to unsettle. So... I met him as part of a small group of journalists at an international conference in 2009, I think it was. And I can't actually remember any of the specifics he said about policy, but what I do remember is his behaviour. Because there was one point where somebody asked a question he didn't like. And rather than answer the question, he said, well, that's a very interesting question, but before I answer it, can I ask you about the extraordinary ring you have on your finger? This guy had a big ring. And and so everyone turns and looks at the, the, the guy. And then Putin says, oh, surely you don't mind me asking about it. I mean, you don't wear something like that unless you're trying to draw attention to yourself. And so everyone in the room starts to laugh and everyone forgets what the question is. And it was a real classic bullying style, which felt faintly funny and a bit unpleasant at the time. Yeah. But now, you know, when just before the invasion, do you remember that big televised scene where Putin gets his aides in and he begins to bully the head of the National Security Council the Russian National Security Council, and says, come on, you're not speaking clearly. What do you mean? And the guy is stuttering and all of that. And I thought, I've seen that before. This is where he humiliates somebody in public before an audience. And that was what he was doing a long time ago. Just, to, I mean, another one who's a really interesting contrast, because I think probably they're the two most important, Xi Jinping and Putin. Xi Jinping, I met again with a small group. Um, this was in 2013. And his style at the time albeit it was a different context, was much more kind of imperial, calm, very much didn't want to lose his temper because he was so above it all. He was yeah. like the emperor and we were sort of sitting with our arms folded and he was kind of reassuring and, and so on. So a, a very different personal style, but actually a political style that's not that different. Yes. So we have to talk about Putin. He's chapter one in your book and you refer to him as the archetype, which sounds like a supervillain <laughs> name if ever there was one. Uh, do you feel like he's floundering right now over in Ukraine that maybe he bit off more than he could chew? Yeah. I I would say so. I mean, I think that one of the things about these strongman leaders and one of the reasons why I sort of end the book on a note of tentative optimism is that the longer they're in power, the more liable they are to become megalomaniac, to become paranoid and to make mistakes. And I think that's probably what happened with Putin, that, you know, he, uh, by all accounts, became quite isolated during the COVID period. He's brooding on history and his, his own place in history. Nobody by this stage can say no to him. And he 
lights upon this scheme to uh, invade Ukraine. And to be fair to him, if one wants to be, say, be fair to Vladimir Putin, he had got away with violence quite a lot in the past. You know, he's murdered people in uh, in, in the UK or had them murdered. Uh, he had invaded Georgia in 2008, Ukraine in 2014. And I think he thought this would be easy, that the Ukrainians would fold, that the victory would come in three days. They obviously had plans to occupy Kiev, put it in a, a puppet government. And to be fair, you know, even the Western intelligence analysts who correctly said he's going to invade two months before he did, a lot of scepticism. They also thought he would win very easily, as he did. But in fact, he hasn't. Mm. And now I think his whole project is in danger. Are strongman leaders always created by insecurity of some kind? Um, because it seems like whether they're left or right, they're always just a bundle of insecurities. Well, I'm not a psychoanalyst, so I tend to sort of look at it from, from more from a political point of view, what they do. But obviously, you think about it as you think about these life patterns of these people. Um, I would say it wouldn't say so much insecure as massively narcissistic. They tend to be people who want it to be all about them. And in that sense, I think uh, Donald Trump fitted it very neatly because he says uh, in his 2016 speech to the Republican convention, I alone can do it. And that's the pitch of the strongman leader that, you know, don't rely on the party, don't rely on the system, rely on me. It's all about me. Yes. Um, I'm uniquely able to do this. And I think there's that. Now, if you want to look at like personality traits that lead to that, you know, one possibility is I think a lot of these leaders had absent fathers. I mean, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but it is interesting. So Putin's father is away a lot in the Second World War fighting. Trump's father is this kind of distant, rather bullying figure. Xi Jinping's father is actually um, imprisoned because he's caught up in the Cultural Revolution, disappears for about 10 years. So maybe that's something to do with the personality type then later that then later emerges. It's disarming that Trump is so open about his admiration for ruthless leaders. Uh, you say in your book how his staff had admitted how excited he'd be to get to schmooze with despots and murderers. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's you know, is one of the really interesting things that uh, one of the sort of advantages of the way Trump ruled for dictate for, for for journalists mm. is that he fell out with so many of his uh, people so they all write about it quite quickly right. so if you look at the memoirs of John Bolton or Fiona Hill who were his kind of very close foreign policy aides they witnessed his interactions with these strongman autocrats up close and personal and they had no doubt that Trump got on best. He couldn't stand people like Angela Merkel, who was like a woman, democratically elected, a bit cautious. Yuck. Yeah, exactly. But Erdogan, he actually says himself to Bob, Bob Woodward, I get on really well with Erdogan. The tougher and meaner they are, the better I like them. And he gets on well with Putin. And in fact, Fiona Hill says that although there was a lot of speculation, you'll remember, about, you know, has Putin got something on him? She thought it was less complicated. She thought it he just admired Putin, yeah. and that's why he got on with him. So interesting. So is Trump, though, really a strong man? I see him more as just somebody who's uh, opportunistic politically and uh, a little wishy-washy. I mean, he's probably strongman adjacent, but um, do, you, do you think that he just is uh, a little reined in by democracy, perhaps? Yeah, no, I would say more than it's um, that a lot of these leaders – have similar political pictures and similar instincts. The political pictures tend to be strongly nationalistic, socially conservative, uh, very, as I say, me-centred, not really interested in the rule of law that much, more about getting it done. Um, but the context in which they operate is is crucial. Yeah. So that if you're Xi Jinping, where you're not operating in a democracy, you can have over a million people arrested, get your personal thoughts written to the Chinese constitution, etc., if you're uh, Donald Trump, you are constrained by the law, although, of course, he tries to overturn an yeah. election on January the 6th, uh, 2021. Yes. So, um, so, but it's, I think, the institutional background in which these people operate really matters. And in fact, I know, irritatingly to many British readers, I did include Boris Johnson in the book. I think he's very much at the fringes of this thing, but he does go for the... I alone can get this done thing, in yeah. this case, this being Brexit. And he also does something illegal with the proroguing of Parliament. But there you get 
institutions kicking back and saying, no, no, you can't do that, Mr. Johnson. And do, um, do you think that Britain is vulnerable to the lure of a strongman or are there enough guardrails in place here? I think everybody's vulnerable. I mean, I think that there are guardrails and that's incredibly important and probably will save us. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I, I think also, you know, the context in which Johnson himself is brought up means that probably he would never do some of the kind of Putin, she things that are a product of a much more brutalized society. But I think that one of the things, certainly if you look at the United States since 2016, is do not be complacent. I mean, who could have imagined the storming of the Capitol, a president say, refusing to accept an election? This is the leader of the free world, and it's happening there. So who's going to say it couldn't happen here? I think that's really a very dangerous thing to say because it makes you complacent and it maybe makes you think, ah, you know... I'm not going to pay attention to this. It doesn't really matter. This is Britain after all. Mm. Well, I mean, you know, we've had a few, you know, we certainly had a more polarised politics around Brexit than I can ever remember. And a lot of the kind of bitterness and hatred in that, I think, is the precursor to people saying, you know what, I don't really care about democracy anymore. I want a strong man to get it done. Yes, yeah. And I think that... France right now is is on the brink. You know, Marine Le Pen would be the first strong woman leader. That's what I was going to ask you about. Could a yeah. woman be a strong man leader? Well, I think the answer is probably yes. Uh, I think the only reason I hesitate is that it's a very macho style of politics. Um, and a lot of the pitch of these leaders, again, is anti-feminist, traditional values. You'll notice that Putin in the middle of uh, the war in Ukraine takes time out to rant about uh, gender madness in the West. Indeed, uh, Viktor Orban, who's another important figure who's in this book, his recent campaign focused a lot on what he called gender ideology being imposed from, and that this is partly to do with trans rights, but it's also kind of more broadly anti-feminist thing. But however, Marine Le Pen, yes, of course she's the descendant of a strongman or the daughter of a strongman, of Jean-Marie Le Pen, mm -hmm. who's now too old to, to carry on. Uh, she's shown a bit of strength herself in actually kicking her own father out of the party and then her niece. Um, and I think, as far as I know, the, the uh, Rassemblement National, used to be the F National Front, is very much a party that's centred around her in that style. It's about a single person. Mm. Uh, and her pitch is the same. It's nostalgic nationalism, it's social conservatism, it's strongly anti-migrant. These are the ingredients you see yes. right across the world. Nostalgia for a time that never really existed. It seems to me, especially after reading your book, that uh, China is really underpinning this this whole age of the strongman. Like That's the future. That's sort of the ideal, isn't it, for, for uh, any future strongman? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it, it is incredibly important simply because it's the only plausible superpower rival to the United States. I mean, I think that Russia's mistake, you know, we were talking about it earlier, probably was that it still felt it could act like a superpower and is discovering really it, it can't. China can. It's, you know, it's, China, th it's throwing its weight around, but China really has the muscle to back it up. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think that the Chinese political system is very unique, but it's certainly the case that Xi's pitch to the world really is, you know what, Western democracy, it's not all it's cracked up to be, doesn't really work very well. Look at my country, we've had 9, 10% growth for 30 years, you know, we've pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, we're very ordered, we've conquered COVID. Interestingly, of course, they're now having real trouble in Shanghai, which is a big problem for Xi Jinping, because again, one of these flaws of the whole strongman model is that because government and the strongman are so closely associated, the strongman is not allowed to make mistakes or to acknowledge mistakes. Putin can never say, yeah, I got Ukraine wrong. That's kind of the end of the whole mystique. Right. And similarly, she can't say, you know what, zero COVID isn't working that well. We're going to have to think of something else. Well, thank you, Gideon Rockman. His new book is The Age of the Strongman. Thank you very much. Pleasure.